I'm April. And I'm Jonathan. This is Xavier, and that's Serena, and we live here in San Diego. Xavier's a very happy toddler, so he is makes us laugh every day. <laughs> will be three in December, uh, born in December of 2020. And some of his favorite things to do are, I'll tell you, number one is eat, uh, which I think is, you know, I probably get that from me or maybe his mom or the both of us. <laughs> he loves to make fart noises, whether on his arm or just <laughs> making, making noise with his lips. Uh, he loves to laugh. Uh, he likes, he's got a number of words he loves to say, like teeth or tasty. Uh, and he likes to play with uh, any, really any toy or a box. Uh, <laughs> or a box. And then if you, if you can make something fall or crash, then even if he can't see it, but he can hear it, like whatever it is, fall over, he thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. Mm hmm and he likes to make other people laugh, so he'll do what he can to make you crack up. There's that, and uh, I'll definitely say it's been, there are some challenges. Uh, I think with any child there are challenges, but definitely one with, uh, you know, special needs or, or additional requirements adds just extra. But, you know, it's from that you get to learn and, and grow. So Xavier was born at 25 weeks, so that's like six months pregnant. Um, and it was an emergency and we took the ambulance to the hospital. That was really scary. I haven't been in an ambulance before, it all happened really fast and I was pretty terrified. Uh, and I remember telling the EMTs in the ambulance that I heard them calling the hospital that we were going to and saying 29 weeks and I was like, no, 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 he's 25. Um, and then got to the hospital and he was born. So it was very fast, it was very scary um, and uh, overwhelming. And then later that night, even in the hospital room, like thinking that that's not really what happens, that can't be real, um, that's not what's supposed to happen. So all of those things. <laughs> And actually, one of the nurses today, uh, there was an event and mentioned how uh, when she first met me, I was unaware that he had already been born uh, probably 20 minutes earlier. And so, because they came in and said, so have you picked a name yet? And I was like, oh, he's here? And then they said, yes, because they wheeled her in, you know, and she was in a different state and, you know, post, post that event. And then... Uh, we went down to the NICU after a while, and there's also, uh, you know, during the, some, I would say some of the height of COVID, and both of us had just had COVID, literally like two weeks to, to the day beforehand. Uh, and so then they had to talk to people about the protocol of, can we even go see him in his isolate? Because do we need to get tested first to make sure that we were no longer positive, but everybody's wearing masks and all that. And so it was just, even then it was some uncertainty uh, they were to say like you were you're two you're two weeks out, so you're good without having to re retest it, and then we we're able to go down and see him in his isolate, his little space pod, if you will. So Xavier was diagnosed with cerebral palsy when he was nine months old, which was six months adjusted age. Uh, we knew that he was high risk to uh, get the diagnosis because of his brain injuries in the NICU. And then being a physical therapist, I had had a few other uh, therapists look at his movements and things even when he was still in the NICU. So we kind of knew that he was going to get that diagnosis already. Um, so when the doctor said it and put it in his paperwork, we were prepared for that. Um, but it's still kind of like a finalizing. Now he has a diagnosis uh, and a disability for the rest of his life. So, you know, you still kind of have that in the back of your mind as a parent, like maybe it will go away. Maybe I can pray hard enough and like, he won't be disabled. So um, there's a little bit of like, you know, uh, feelings of just like anxiety and attached to it, I think. 
I think uh, once it was his diagnosis of CT was was stated, uh, I I think I, I saw it as a uh, okay now we can start because now now we know now without a doubt that this is a diagnosis and so from there we can work to make sure we're working with the right doctors and therapists in order to you know and and seek out those opportunities uh, to make sure that his development is you know we can give him every op every chance of developing um, better or you know being just being good good parents because uh, we always want the best for our children so seeing him the first time in, in the NICU in his isolate uh, was it's surreal ish because uh, you're like okay he's, he's there there is this being that is being uh, that is alive most because of the you know expert work quick work for, by the medical professionals but also the all this equipment that's making lots of noise and there's lots of other you know other children and other families that are in different stages of being in the NICU um, so but like with most things in life I personally was just like this is what it is and so can't change what it is right now and just look look you know try to find that silver lining and opportunity to learn and grow and then hopefully share that message which I guess is kind of where we are now after our 109 day in the NICU. I feel like I'm a therapist that works with kids that have CP and so I need to be his therapist too but really I'm his mom first so sometimes I struggle with that still um, like should I be at home doing therapy with Xavier uh, so I have to remind myself that I am his parent and on the same like the same note I feel very fortunate that I know all of the things that I do and I've worked with all the kids that I've worked with in the past because they've given me a great perspective and ability to be the best parent to Xavier that I can and help advocate for him and get him uh, the care then the services that he needs. Being a dad and you know um, of a child with a disability you know you're definitely it definitely is a different perspective than um, you know a, a father or a parent of somebody who doesn't have a disability it's just a, obviously certain milestones there are they're not they're not going to meet or achieve at the same at the same normative rate which is still a sliding scale uh, but it, they're just you know when when people ask ask like how old he is because uh, he because he definitely is smaller and so it's like oh he's, he'll be three in December and people you know you can kind of see their expressions change a little bit when people say like well you know you can see in their brain the brain bubble says looks pretty small for his age and you have to explain well he's got cerebral palsy and that affects his physical development uh, and so it kind of helps educate people a little bit more uh, which I have no problem you know, I've spent a lot of a lot of my career in the Navy is, is on the educational or training side so I really have no problem training and educating people about you know cerebral palsy and, and just in his condition or even just sharing our story because I know that there are lots of other people who uh, may be introduced to a similar situation, you know, whether they like it or not. The Zing Portable. It's important um, to have Xavier in an upright position because that's development mentally at his age what he should be doing. Uh, and then the Zing Portable has the hip abduction feature, which is a must for me for any patient or my own kid um, for maintaining his hip alignment and um, hopefully avoiding any hip dysplasia. Uh, so that is an important feature. And then I was using Zing before the Zing Portable came out and I loved their standards uh, because the uh, parts are so easy to adjust. So we get a lot of kids, um, kids that have CB can have one leg that's longer he does actually, so you need to be able to adjust um, the leg on one side versus the other. And other standards can't do that or they didn't used to. Um, so the Zing was one of the first ones I had used that you can adjust it easily and you don't need tools in your pocket or you know a therapist or a vendor to adjust it, so. As me as the non-PT, <laughs> uh, but engineer by degree for undergrad, I, I love the uh, a number of like design features where the uh, the the tripod aspect of it it's very secure 
Uh, so depending on what he's doing, I, I don't have to worry about just the legs. Uh, but the way they collapse, it's, you know, really it's like a one-handed um, action to release and have the legs collapse in. Uh, the ease of switching out from whether it's he's in a prone or supine, uh, you know, laying on his back or laying to laying on his stomach to, to switch that out, it's pretty easy. Um, we've sent him sent it with them to his daycare and his daycare workers who are you know, not trained therapists and nurses are able to easily put him in and out of it so that he can interact with his uh, the other the other kids in his daycare and breaking it down. Uh, I can easily put it into a duffel bag to travel with and then re easily reassemble, re reassemble and reattach everything so that he can continue a standing program when we do travel. So if you have a child that is diagnosed with CP, absolutely I say get them standing as soon as you can. So I mean we started when he was nine months adjusted age because that's when other kids start pulling to stand. Uh, and just make it part of their routine because once you start doing it then they know that it's part of their day um, because it's so beneficial on so many so many different levels. I would say we, we try to get them in the standard probably just about every day depending on what's going on. Our goal is five days so he usually gets that. <laughs> yeah. And then you know I would say up to an hour yeah. in, in each, each, each time. There's so much potential right now so he's still in the stage where he's gaining skills um, so, you know, we're hoping that he will walk with some assistive device on his own and be able to navigate that way. Um, we're pretty sure he's going to start talking and just might need a little more time until that happens. And then as far as, yeah, there you go. See, he talks. We just don't know what he's saying yet. <laughs> uh, I mean, with newer technology and uh, hopefully it, it, some advancements, maybe, you know, exoskeletal suits and whatever else. You know, I think that there will really be no limits uh, for him and, and, and his future. Uh, and if anything, he'll, you know, be able to engage and continue to um, inspire anyone and everyone, you know, about that, uh, that really no challenge is truly insurmountable, uh, especially if you have a great network and a community around you.